We're here in Callanish at last with two dear friends that I've been talking about all the way, Margaret and Ron Curtis. They've become completely obsessed and um, everything that they've discovered is uh, eye-opening and fantastic. Having come to Callanish, and it's like an empty crossword or something, mm. or a, an undone jigsaw, you just get in and do it. Ron and I met up at a very early stage and he taught me how to do the surveying and horizon profiles. It was a very scientific thing, checking the astronomy. Once you put the lunar stuff in, it all fell into place. Say so these sites are lunar, lunar observatories, if you like. Mm. They were also a centre of focus for the community. These people had a lot more knowledge than we have nowadays about the natural movements of the sun and moon. The very layout of this main site is like a calculator or an almanac. You can go back and read what's happening. It would work today. You only need to be here a couple of months and you can tell exactly how far you are through the 18 and a half year cycle. At Callanish here, it's gone beyond the sort of practical into a much more ceremonial thing. Each site is like a stage set. You view through it and the gaps between the stones form a frame. <laughs> He's probably replicating a ceremonial that took place 5,000 years ago, once a month, for a few months every 18 and a half years. These times when the moon was on its very low track. And the audience, or congregation, whatever you want to call them, weren't in the circle, they were down at the far end of the avenue. So let's go and see what it was they were looking at. This funny spacing of stones is real. There aren't any stones missing here. The positioning of these and spacing is critical to keeping tabs on what the moon was up to and what it's going to do tomorrow night. Because if you've got this drama, you don't want it to go wrong. Whoever's in charge, a single person or a committee, has got to know what's going to happen tomorrow night. A Kalanish here, it's, it's primarily to do with the moon, but the moon related to those Mother Earth hills. Kayach na Montach. In Gaelic, it's the, the old woman of the moors, but in English, people refer to her as sleeping beauty. If they weren't there, the Callanish stones wouldn't be here. Now you see Sleeping Beauty again. And in fact, this stone is set a little bit skew to the others. And I don't know if it's possible to view along this. And so that it almost directs your eye to Sleeping Beauty. And can you try and imagine the moon appearing just about at her knees and rolling up to the right, skimming the leftmost stone and dropping into the hilltop. It's not the last sighting we get of the moon because you see the tallest stone of the world inside the circle and at the ground level beside that is the point where the moon is going to reappear in that spot where Julian's standing. He would be totally engulfed by the moon if he would just fit it neatly. The audience or congregation stand back, they view through the circle, and when the moon reappears, you can have someone standing inside it. Now, this isn't scientific, it's, it's drama, it's ritual, whether it's the new king, priestess, or it just gives authority to the person that's within the moon. The ancients were very theatrical. To a certain extent, they became what I would term even like the first glam rockers. Recently, it's been discovered that um, the ancients were wearing makeup, that the women were wearing glamorous outfits, that the guys were swanning around in good gear. You know, this idea that they were barbarians is fairly kind of misleading. They were taking control of their lives and as they were taking control of their lives they were feeling better about themselves you feel better about yourself your sense of your physical makes you stand more upright and that's what you become I think the sites have such a relationship with rock and roll because the sites were places where people came 
for their theatre, where they came to dance, where they came for their drama, to bring drama in and to make them feel taller, to make them feel better about themselves. They were agriculturists. Like maybe sometimes their harvest had failed, but when they came to the site, you know, there would be uh, there would be a sense of, hey, we've achieved this. We've achieved these the building of these huge stones. When we um, when we get beyond Inverness, it's the same as being in Lands End. It's what I term beyond Rome. So the whole psychology of the place changes because where the Romans didn't build their straight roads, you don't have linear thought. Thought starts to get a bit more serpentine. Everybody starts to wend their way everywhere. It's a bit like the, uh, the journey starts to become important again. People aren't just concerned with getting there. The journey is actually uh, an important part of it. When we get to mainland Orkney, about three miles from the ferry, we'll be picking up one of the greatest sacred landscapes left, built around five and a half thousand years ago. Can't tell if we're gonna get a smooth ferry crossing. Um, yeah, well, the ancients came over. They used to cross over 5,000 years ago, so if they could do it in eight-seater canoes, we can surely do it with a P&O. I have no desire to go back to the Neolithic. They only did it in eight-seater canoes because that's all they had. If the Neolithics had had electric guitar, they'd have been playing it. If Beethoven had electric guitar, he'd have been playing it. If anybody who's a forward-thinking mofo has something brand new, they're using it. They were forward-thinking. Even if they were inching forward, they were forward-thinking. We're close now because we're in Thurso, so we're getting very close to the, um, the motel that I played. Every summer I took my family and then we just move around and play various gigs and um, the gigs would pay for my field work. This is the place, the new way in. I played here in 1993. Nobody wanted me to be playing, nobody thought it was entertaining, apart from one Julian Cope fan. I was being supported by this uh, Australian guy called Gypsy Dave Smith, who's really, really heavy and a lovely guy, who's playing a 1935 Dobro. And he'd always be like, keep your pants away from me, Dobro. And I was standing there, I was going, what do you think, Dave? He went, you're in trouble. I said, what is it? And I held up two pairs of shorts that I was going to wear. I said, sooty shorts or daffy duck shorts? And I went on stage, and a nine minute vocal mantra and nobody gave me any grief at all. We've left Scrabster, the uh, northernmost ferry terminal, crossing over to Orkney mainland. First thing we're gonna see is we're gonna see Hoy, this great island made of a big, dark, dark rock with a, a famous stack known as the Old Man of Hoy. When we come around Hoy, we'll find that the rest of the Orkney Islands are much, much lower. In fact, the whole orientation of Orkney is south, because wherever you're standing on the Orkneys, you're looking, your eyes are transfixed by these two huge uprisings of dark rock, always looking down at the mountains of Hoy. Hoy is what every Orcadian stares at all of their life. <laughs> 